tonight, it is our desire to create in you an awareness of both the manifest external world around us in which we live and also the creative intent that loves us, that loved us from the beginning, that will always love the substance that was spun from his own heart out into the world of form and composes all things we come in contact with, including the substance of our own soul. And this we must realize. We must realize the infinitude of God's love, a moving love that moves vitally throughout all the forces of nature. The diastole and the systole of the heart are the closest to us because we can feel the pulsation of the love of God within ourselves. And this breathing nearness ought to create awareness in ourselves that something highly intelligent, highly sensory, reaching out and reaching to each of us is concern for our welfare and concern that we love one another. The love of God is not a human love. It transcends all human loves and it brings all love to the fructification of purpose, of genuine purpose that does not endure just for our lifetime, but endures with the pyramids, and particularly with the pyramid of life. And as we begin then to examine the external chain of events that manifests around us, let us consider for a moment the ribonucleic chain, the RNA and the DNA factors that are concerned with the quality of life inherent within the genes that produce the differentiation of man's physical nature and probably even retain some remnant of his character drives. Let us look for a moment upon the material, the substance that God has placed in the sperm within the womb. The place contains there all of the factors that determine the color of the eyes, the color of the hair, that determine the stature of the man or the woman, the body build, the mentality, the dexterity, the thought processes, the total man is actually involved in these genes. And now today in our time, we are finding once again as in the age of Atlantis for life does recycle. In other words, great scientists lived thousands of years ago that had even more knowledge than our present day scientists. This a lot of people do not realize, but it is true. And therefore many years ago mutations were created. Mutations that developed grotesque formations of so-called human beings blending with animals before the seed was directed by the inherent divine intelligence within it to only produce after its kind. Then came the flood of Noah, the great deluge that wiped the earth clean from these monstrous creatures which were distortions of God's purposes and intent. Women's heads fastened upon horses and all kinds of other distortions, most too grotesque to even speak about or think about, were destroyed from the face of the earth in those ancient times. And the fiat came forth from God that trembled the web of light that passes throughout the universal substance and said, Henceforth, let all substance bear after its kind. Let all seed bear after its kind. And as in all cases of divine fiats uttered from the heart of the Logos, which is a Greek word meaning the word, the word, the word of God, the seed obeyed and human beings remained fixed to human beings, not to animals. And so we see 
that many of the original plans of God were distorted and people literally monkeyed with the RNA and the DNA chain and they sought to produce the generic results that they wanted to produce without having the generic knowledge or the integrity of spirit that a scientist of this capacity had ought to have. Yet they had the power. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely, was an utterance made quite a few years ago. And the truth of it is before us still. And spiritual power also can come into this category. We also can take into this category economic situations. We can take people situations. We can take anything into this category. And we certainly ought not to take the creation of people and the interference with their lives out of this category and say, well, we're not concerned. Because today the pages of Time magazine and the pages of Life magazine and many other magazines are portraying the intentions of our modern day scientists who say individualized freedom is bad for people. As the English might say, balderdash. It is ridiculous to even make such a statement, for even God, the great creator of life, has always been concerned that we should have our individualized freedom, even to our individualized hurt. Why? Because Individual freedom is a key. It is a key whereby man is able to create as God did, ultimately, and by attaining these spiritual processes to learn how to guide his own individual life, his thought processes, without interference from others. Freedom, true freedom. This has always been the forte of that great ascended master whose portrait in oils hangs over here. Saint Germain. He has always been concerned with individualized freedom because he knew and he knows that individualized freedom is the key to Godhood. Creativity vested in the Godhead is also partially vested in your head. Each and every one of us, whether we know what we ought to know or whether we don't know, are still given the prerogative of making our own decisions and having control of the creative energy allotted to us from our divine presence, the I am presence, individualized. It is entirely up to us then to determine what use we will make of that energy. I find a passage from St. Paul that goes like this. So then there is a law working in my members the good that I would do, that I do not. And the evil that I would not do, that I do. St. Paul then plainly spoke of how that latent images and force fields and thought forms and the infections that we pick up from human beings upon this earth can work out in our own life stream to produce those unwanted designs that are here in the garbage dump of the world thought, existing side by side as though we had two planes of manifestation. One, for example, as though while we were here gathered together to worship God, in another plane a greyhound bus would be driving through here with all kinds of people walking through here and we wouldn't see them or feel them and they wouldn't see us or feel us. This change in the frequencies of matter is a divine potential and possibility. God could have a whole world on the head of a pin or he could take the whole solar system to be just our backyard. It would be entirely relative to his wishes and designs. But as it is now, these things are relative to one another. And what we are concerned with is the invisible poisons 
that lurk in the atmosphere that can be picked up of negative situations that arise in the world of form from which we would escape by the creation through God of this beautiful tube of light, a shower of radiant energy from the heart of God that can be invoked and has stopped a bullet many times even when fired from an elephant gun and it just dropped to the ground because man can, if he will, learn to create that tube of light around himself as an effective shield against the intrusion of unwanted energy. You have to learn your own system of defense. I am convinced by absolute cosmic law and genuine cosmic experience that human beings who are unhappy, human beings who are bored with life, human beings who have a distorted or a warped vision of life, who are not getting out of life what they ought to, are purely suffering the results of their own wrong acts by not defending themselves. Well, you say, now they have never heard of the tube of light, and so they are very, very vulnerable. Yes, I agree with you. That is why this organization exists in part, to create the dissemination of cosmic knowledge to the earth that man can learn the necessary defenses to protect himself so that he doesn't have to fight at the drop of a hat to protect his own domain, but rather he can understand how he can create this cosmic invulnerability, the invulnerability of the tube of light around his own physical form extending nine feet in diameter. Every man and every woman has the magnificent crystal cord descending from the heart of their divine presence and the forgiveness that pours down through this crystal cord is absolutely unbelievable because you are dealing with what St. John calls the river of life. And the river of life is individualized. It is individualized for you and it's individualized for me. We all and all mankind have it. The river of life is crystal. It is radiant, it is bubbling, it is effervescent. It will make you truly divinely happy. You don't need any worldly champagne if you can get on the divine bandwagon and put yourself on God's campaign. You see what I mean? Because you have everything in the heart of that presence of God. And it comes down in this crystal flowing stream or river the crystal cord. A long time ago, back in the old Methodist church that was located way out in the country to the tune of a little old organ where they sang all these songs, they sang when the golden bowl is broken and the silver cord, they called it, is loosened. And I rise, you see, into that higher sphere. They talked about it. Clairvoyance, way back in the 1800s, reported standing over dying people and watching the loosening of the silver cord. We are not dealing with a new concept, but we are dealing with an old concept, as old as the hills, the concept of man's relation to God. I think the greatest thing in the world is this concept that each one of us has a string, a cord of light, connected to our heart. It beats our heart, and that cord goes back to the heart of the living God. Somehow or other, we find all these disconnected, discombobulated people wandering around the world here and telling us what an awful, miserable life they're having. They don't have to have misery in their life. Why, if they do have the type of misery that karma produces, the formula to cure the misery is already in existence. God has said, I will not allow, I will not allow you to be tempted above that you are able to resist. That is a promise. There is no excuse for density and darkness and uncomprehension 
for continuing to live in our world. We have the teaching here by God's grace. And we're not concerned with trying to create an illusion to any man or to try to tell any church in this world that they are wrong and we are right and we're the only one. We let the people that come here make up their own mind. That's the important thing. And the people that never come and have never heard this teaching, well, bless their hearts. We do everything we can to try to create blessing and love and friendship in their midst, even though it profits us not from a human standpoint. But it does profit and fatten our soul to know that we call to God to bring down into this world his love. And do you know something? A lot of people don't know this. If you don't make a call to God for his love, the world may not get it. Why is that, you see? Because you are the authority upon this planet. When you tie yourself to your God presence, you are the authority because you act for God. Do you remember the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? Did you ever hear of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, what happened when the angels came down to destroy it? The angels made contact with Lot, didn't they? And Abraham. They made contact with Abraham first. And they told him, they said, we're going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He didn't like the idea because Lot was living there. And Lot was close to it. So, he said, well, Lord, he said, I know you've got the power to do it. You can destroy this city if you want to. But he said, just supposing, Lord, that there's 100 good people living there. Would you destroy the city then? God looked at him, he said, no. He said, if there's 100 good people there, I won't destroy it. Abraham spoke again, and he said, uh, very zealously, well, what if there's, there's 50 good people there? Would you destroy the city? No, he says, I wouldn't destroy it if there's 50 good people there. So finally he got down, he said, Lord, he said, I know it. I don't want to make you angry. He said, you're a great creator. You're the creator of the universe. You have all the wisdom. He said, if there's just 10, 10 good people there, will you spare the city? The Lord looked at him and he said, if there's 10 good people there, I'll spare the city. But there wasn't. So Sodom and Gomorrah went down the drain into the desert. It was fused by atomic energy, which some people say, What? Did you say by atomic energy? Well, that wasn't even created back there. They'd never heard of it. They'd never heard of nuclear fission. Well, I said atomic energy and I meant it because that's exactly how it was done. And it was a similar situation to over Hiroshima and Nagasaki in, in World War II. When they dropped the bomb, it was the same situation. Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed because, listen, dear folks, this earth is not the only world in space. Go out under any canopy of heaven in any hemisphere and gaze up at the sky and look at the sky and notice the myriad stars that are there and remember the words of God to Abraham. He said, I will make thy seed as the sand of the sea and the stars innumerable. This is what God said. And... I tell you something. Man, the product of divine love, was created in order to become a God of his own universe. He was not created to be a controlled being, controlled by everyone's whimsy and by circumstances and by environment and by destructive desires. He was created to master his desires. And with God, I tell you tonight, all things are possible. You can say to me, well, I don't believe it's possible for me, and I can tell you, change your state of consciousness by turning it on to the Christ. Change your state of consciousness by recognizing that you have a presence individualized for you, that you have a holy Christ self, the universal Christ that said, here is the whole loaf, he said, this is my body broken for you. Take eat. The true Lord's Supper is the recognition by man that he has an individualized Christ self, that that Christ self is central 
as far as mediatorship goes, as communion goes with his divine presence. That Christ's self has a direct contact with every soul on this earth. No one needs to fear. Everyone can open up wide and say, well, thank God that there is a universal Christ. What is this universal Christ? All things were made by him, and without him was nothing made that was made. Well, you say, how can this be? Christ lived 2,000 years ago. I tell you, nay, Christ has always been. For by him all things were made, and without him was nothing made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, St. John said. So what are we talking about? We're talking about light. What did Einstein tell you about light? Energy and light. You know what science has told you, that matter can neither be destroyed nor created. Well, all things can be molded, can they not? And that is the term we use in thinking of creativity. We think of the great master potter who sat there before the potter's wheel of light as it was turning, and he began to mold and shape each individual. And he gave you a pure and beautiful radiant lantern of a soul, a lantern that can light the whole world, for any one of you can do it. What Christ did, you can do. He said, as he ascended up from Bethany's hill, the things that I do shall ye do, and greater things shall ye do, because I go unto my Father. And what do you have today but a ministry that blasphemes and accuses you of blasphemy if you say, I believe that God can do this through me or that God can live in me and perform his marvelous works? Do we have people trying to keep it all for themselves without sharing his broken body for all of us? We all need his broken body. It is a body of forgiveness when you need forgiveness. It's a body of strength when you need strength. It's a body of resurrection when you need to be resurrected. It's a body of zeal when you need zeal. This is a body of purpose, and it is an orderly purpose. It transcends all this world. It transcends all human personality. We are nothing without Christ, nothing without an I am presence, without a contact with this, the human down here, would not even be able to produce the violet transmuting flame of forgiveness. The human down here would not be even able to play out the role of his human self. He couldn't even function as an animal without the perfection of God. Now look at yourself. Right now they're running a series in life. And what are they showing? The marvels of the convolutions of the brain. They're showing the cerebellum, the cerebrum, in the various components of medulla oblongata. <coughs> They're showing the dura mater and the pia mater with a beautiful liquid light flowing across it, which they don't describe in this manner exactly. But they're not showing you the harms that people do by disbelief and even by physical tarry substances inherent in cigarettes, for example. Do you know that man's brain originally was golden? Today we refer to it as gray matter. Gray matter. No wonder El Moria come out with one statement in his books. And uh, it was just in complete refutation of that business on gray matter. Oh yes, he called it, he said, there are gray ones, he said, upon this planetary body. And what did St. John say? He said, ye are neither hot nor are you cold. Therefore, I will spew you out of my mouth. God wants people that are either on fire for him or on fire for whatever they're on fire for. Because if they're that way, you see, there is a chance then, if you get one of these people that are on fire for everything they shouldn't be, you get them into the kingdom of heaven, they turn right around and they're on fire for God just like they were on fire for everything else. But you take some of these half-baked people that never seem, to, never seem to come to the point of browning on top. <laughs> they, they just sit there and you put all the heat on and they dry up and finally they come out and you say, oh, I burned it all. <laughs> and it's no good. Take it out of the oven. So God wants somebody that has a spark, somebody that's active, 
It's easy to criticize the other fellow. But you want to remember one thing, that the French have this old saying, they say that whenever you point the finger at somebody else, you got three fingers pointing at you. <laughs> Isn't it true? So let's learn the process of divine forgiveness and not act as an impediment in the body of God. Upon this planetary body, you have the body of God. Now, I have always believed that God created this world out of love. And I have always believed that he had a high and a beautiful purpose. And I have always believed that that purpose must be revealed. Now it's coming forth through the teachings of the masters. It's not a product of my poor little brain. It's a product of the ascended masters' wisdom and teachings to which I aspire with you. We have these meetings, focalizations, get together so that we can disseminate this information. Yes, I expect this organization to supplant the Catholic Church completely. I expect this organization to sweep every church there is in the whole world out of existence, ultimately. I mean every single word I say, and you know why? Because they're either going to have to lick us or join us, one of the two. They will not have a chance because the truth will prevail. And the truth is that God is in man. They turn around and they tell you how evil you are. They tell you about all your passions for evil. They tell you about all the wickedness that's in the world. They tell you about all the negativity that's in the world. They tell you about all the wars and the troubles of the world. Well, we can read them in our daily newspaper. We don't have to hear about it in church. But they tell you about this that you already know. And then they say, 2,000 years ago, a man came down by the name of Jesus Christ and he died for your sins. And by that very statement, they are telling you that God, is a God of anger and wrath against people. They are telling you that by the crucifixion of Jesus Christ on the cross, that by that act, and I say it happened, I didn't say it didn't happen, but they say that by that act, that God is going to forgive everybody forever for everything they've ever done. When St. Paul comes right out and tells you in his own writings, he said, if you turn around, he says, after you've heard the gospel, the teachings, the good news of the Christ, and you go right back into the same sin you were in before, he said there remains for you no hope except a certain fiery looking forth to judgment. Now a lot of people have misinterpreted that. They think that that means if they make one little blasted mistake, just one, after they have been saved according to the perceptions and conceptions of some religious people, that then they're, they're damned forever and they're going down to hell. They think that's what it means. It doesn't mean that. It means that judgment must come to you. And that judgment may or may not be pleasant. And here's what the judgment is. It plainly states in the Bible, it says some men's sins are open beforehand going to judgment. And some men they follow after. This means that everybody does not have the same acceleration or the same handling or systemizing of their sins. Some people are so conscientious, like the old Indians. They used to sit around in front of the fire. And every day they sat there at night, and they'd sit in front of the fire, and they'd take all of the uh, wrongs that they had done for the day, and they'd see them, just momentarily, not for long. Just put them in their mind. They'd say, Lord, great spirit, get ye Manitou. They'd say, please take these sins. And they'd throw the sins into the fire, and they'd ask God to forgive them. These are people whose sins went to heaven for judgment beforehand. But a lot of people don't want a day of reckoning, and so they keep on saying, Oh Lord, please, 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 forgive me for all the wrong I've done, and don't punish me for any of it. And so they pile up a huge mountain of a debt, and then they come back into this world one of these days, and all that mountain is sitting there. And they look at the mountain and they say, Oh, what is that? I don't want to look. <laughs> and they turn away from it, and they built the mountain, you know. They put the mountain up there. And then they say, I don't want to look, because it was God's mercy that allowed it to pile up because they kept on asking about it. They said, please don't punish me. And so God didn't. And then it all comes there, and there it is, it's got to be paid. The bill must be paid. I am the bill collector, you know. And so the Lord's of karma are the bill collector. And a man comes to the point where he says, Lord, now I want to enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
And the bill collector standing there, and he said, well, your mansion is waiting, but he said, you do have a mortgage against it. <laughs> so I'd like you to pay this mortgage off first, and then you can enter in, you see. And that's exactly how karma works. But everybody doesn't handle their karma the same way. One of the old masters over in India, he tells a story about how he wandered along in the jungle. He's wandering along in the jungle, and a great big cobra was twined in a tree. And it come right over to him, and he knew it could strike him from where it was. So he looked at it, and he says, that's all he did. He just clucked a little bit and smiled, and the cobra went away. <laughs> because he had faith that the cobra wasn't going to get him, and he said, well, he said, if it's going to get me, it's my karma. So I'll just leave it to God, and he said, welcome, brother cobra. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? People are so apprehensive toward God. I've seen both kinds of people. You have St. Teresa. St. Teresa with the cancer on her knee. The cancer was on her knee so terrible that she couldn't hardly stand it. And she was assigned by the Mother Superior to take a rag and sponge and scrub the stairs. And that's what she did. She went up the stairs, one after the other, scrubbing these, and every step was a step of pain. And by the way, she made it. She not only made it up the physical marble stairs of the church where she was at, she made it up the stairs to heaven. And today, many people have actually been assisted and healed by an appeal to St. Teresa. This is an interesting fact because someday you may be in her position. Not that you'll have the cancer, I hope, but you might have a chance to get up to heaven and make your ascension through this very work. And when you get there, you may assist some of the people who didn't make it in getting there. That's what it's all about. It's about helping each other. There's nothing wrong with Jesus Christ. Don't get me wrong with that. He's the greatest master I've ever met in my life. But, I mean, he expects all of us to fulfill the role of him. We're supposed to become living Christ. But we're not going to become living Christ by just worshiping Jesus. Because worship does not produce the miracle. Imitation does. We have to imitate him in the regeneration. In this generation, we have to learn to put the seal of God on our own forehead and in the palm of our hands. Shall I tell you tonight what that means? Putting it in your forehead means that you got it in your mind. And putting it in your hand simply means that you put it to work in action. Do you understand? That's all that means. It's a mystical symbol. I will write my law in their hearts, will I write them, saith the Lord. Well, it's really very simple. Unless we can do the things that Christ did, we're not going to be regenerated. And we can start whenever we want to. It doesn't matter what church you belong to or what doctrine you believe. It's the truth that will make you free. And the truth is that man is born, and he was born one time the first time, into a veil of flesh. And after he's born once, he didn't make it. So they marked down his card, failed to pass the grade. He's got to take it over again. So he comes back and eats more oatmeal. And his mama nurses him again. He learns to walk and toddle around, and then he challenges with the world again, and he still don't make it. So he comes back and back and back and winds up as General Patton. And we imagine that one of these days, General Patton will be back too. And I dare say, if the man ever turns to the light 100%, that he'll be as zealous for the light and as great a winner for God as he was in the battles of Germany. And the point I'm trying to make is that a man's character is all that he really has. Your character is all that you have, what you really are. Unless you are changed from glory unto glory by the Spirit of the Lord unless you can awake from the lethargy of your sleep in your own human little self and recognize that you are a great being, every one of you. You have a marvelous potential and there is no reason in the world except the reasons that you create in your mind or that somebody pops into your mind that you have there and hold there that says, I can't do it. Of course you can do it. You say your neighbors are going to not like it if you take up the study of the light. One man was telling me about how a minister 
call this religion here a cult. Don't be alarmed. It's standard procedure. They have to call it something. It kind of gets in their hair. They don't like it. But we're not creating this organization so they don't like it. This organization was created by God to help people. And that it will do. So don't be afraid of what anybody calls us or what anybody calls you. It doesn't matter what they call you. You know, we used to say that. We used to say, I don't care what you call me as long as you don't call me too late for breakfast. <laughs> now, of course, my mentors have told me that in most cases I should try to cut down on my breakfast. <laughs> and eat two meals a day. But the point I'm trying to make here is don't be afraid of what public opinion is about you. When I was seven or eight years old, I used to take clocks and telephones apart. And my neighbors have never forgotten that to this day. If I return to my hometown like Jesus returned to Nazareth, they say, here comes the clock taker aparter, and here comes a telephone destructor. <laughs> People never forget the wrongs you do or have done. Don't worry about it. Be glad that God forgets it. And that's all that comes. And you forget it, so you don't get hung up in it. Don't get hung up on your ideas of yourself, how small you are, how little you are, how impractical you are, how uh, this or that person doesn't like you, or how this or that person has misunderstood you. You don't have as much money as you want. You wish you had more talent. Oh, you can wish so many things. Don't worry about that. If you get God, you've got it all. It's just a matter of time and you'll be able to work it out. I never thought that I would ever stand up here. In fact, I never had any idea this place would exist. But when I was 30 years old, living entirely in another state and climb, doing an entirely different job, I had a vision of myself in Colorado, in Colorado Springs, in a huge house. And I couldn't understand, but here I am. You see what I mean? So none of us know just what we really are going to do, but don't worry about it. The biggest problem that men create is the problem of creating worries. Man is a creator, he can create worries, can he? He can create worries, he can create evil as well as good, can he? Well, go ahead and create evil if that's what you want to do, but you'll pay for it. And if you create good, you're going to receive good in return, and you'll be rewarded. Abraham also saw something else very wonderful. He saw a great big shield. And the Lord spoke out of that and he said, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. If everybody would stop to consider it that way, they try to relate to the universe. Don't try to be separate from the universe. Don't try to be separate from humanity. We're all one. You know how those Christmas tree bulbs work? You pull one out of the socket and all the rest of them blink out. You put it back in, they all go on. Maybe it's that way with you. Maybe the world needs your light. I think they do. Start putting it out. Realize you can make a bigger body bulb, or you can produce more current, or you can get a brighter light. Just strike a little flint into the tinder and create your light. Let your candle shine. Let your light shine. Stop all the human nonsense of worrying over what's going to happen. Concerned with your family, concerned about your economic future, concerned about the problems of your country. Rest assured that you can do a little bit about it. And sometimes some of you may be able to do a lot about it. But don't worry about it. Because worry doesn't produce anything. Take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow will take thought for itself, was the words of the great master. Tonight we are going to hear a dictation from beloved Mother Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I feel that the words that you will hear spoken by Mary will be very encouraging and helpful to you, but they won't help you a bit unless you listen to them and heed them. And so tonight I've tried to bring you a little glimpse of the relationship of man and God. God is the creator first. He gives you the right to create as he did. By his creative power in you, you have either created good or ill. If you've created ill, you're reaping the harvest of that. But it's not necessary. You can turn the whole tables around and upside down. You can start right now. I didn't say that Jesus didn't die on the cross. All I'm saying to you is 
the same thing that God's angel said to Abraham. Abraham carried his only son Isaac out into the wilderness. He built a great big altar. He wanted to appease God. And he was going to offer his son Isaac on that altar. He took a great big knife in his hand. He was going to come down and stab the boy and burn him. Nice business, isn't it? Which of you, if you have a son or a daughter, would do a thing like this? But Abraham was a good man, a man after God's own heart. He was acting in faith. He thought he was doing right. But he never did it. Just remember that. The angel come along and said, Abraham, Abraham, do it not. And so he offered a ram that was captured in the thickets there in its place, and Isaac was let go. And I'm telling you now that the same is true of Jesus Christ. God did not demand that Jesus be the propitiation for the sins of man by dying, but by living. The important events in Jesus' life were his offer of himself to God. Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business were his words spoken to his mother and father when he went away from them, when they went up to the tax collector in Jerusalem. Wist means know ye not. Wist ye not. So you see, he was about his father's business. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cleansed the lepers. He performed all of the works of God among men. He was hated and despised by people. Yet, People feared him and they knew that he had a power and authority that was not his own. It was a power and authority that came from the living God. And it came from the same authority and source that spoke to Moses in the burning bush. Nuk pa nuk. I am that I am. We should learn to understand this and have faith in the great God power that is in ourselves. This is not a lie, it is truth. We have a God power in ourselves. And we have a Christ in ourselves. What do men do with him? They put him to an open shame. They crucify him today again, afresh. You see, the crucifixion of Christ had that been the means of wiping out the slate. In other words, you've got a slate over here. And on it is written some word that says sin, S-I-N. It says you did it. Christ would have come along and by his death, according to most of the teachings of the churches today, and you'd put the eraser on that board. There wouldn't be any more sin at all. It's exactly what it says in the Bible, if you really understand it. He'd have put the eraser on the board because it says, in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. What does that really mean? What it really means is that if a man is made alive in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The man has to be renewed. And that is a matter of sacrificing his old carnal nature to the living power of the regenerate God that is also within him. He's dual. Man is both demon and God. He's got to get rid of the demon and keep the God. What is the demon? The demon in man is the personal demon that people have when they say, I have this, or I'll have that, and nobody's going to stop me, even God. Well, you know, that isn't the way we should talk. That isn't the way we should be. But God isn't going to come down and pull a little child out of a fireplace. A little golden-haired babe is creeping into a hot, red-hot fire. And if a child reaches a fire, her hair will be scorched, and be burned over 40% of her body, and she'll die. No angels materialize. No God materializes. If the parents put the child there and left her in the room and the fire burning, God isn't going to interfere. Man has free will. This is law. And the purpose of it is to teach man. Somebody says, well, I can't remember that I was ever here on earth before. I don't remember my embodiments. But your soul does. You see, God is interested in preserving not the mystique of your physical body with all of its pain and powder and mascara. God is interested in, for you men, your hair oil. I mean, God is interested in preserving the reality of your soul. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. It's not a matter of uh, the body itself. It's a matter of preserving the soul so the soul knows. And that's why the soul learns its lessons through the experiences we have. Let us understand then 
that we can be washed and purified by the Christ. And the sacrifice of the Christ is that my body was broken for you. That's the communion. Well, it is already self-evident in the fact that there is a Holy Christ self for everybody. And so the body is broken. And one day it will all come together again in a unity of purpose. And all men will begin to live and love and be as God wants them to be. Let me tell you something. At that moment, all of the beautiful creative acts that created universes without end and shining stars and spiral nebulae and little streamers of light and even asteroids in space will all come into meaning in man because man will suddenly begin to understand that there's a plan behind the whole works and that plan is so beautiful and so lovely and so active now we don't have to wait we don't have to wait till tomorrow it works right now tonight people can be healed they can be sealed they can be enlightened they can be lifted they can be brought into happiness and joy and the character of God just by a thought, by a word, because a thought is a powerful seed of light planted within every man. You can have that, you can be that, and you are that. Now rest in that faith.